Welcome to another episode of the Sales Master Series. I'm Jeb Blunt, CEO of Sales Gravy and author of Fanatical Prospecting. I've got with me Anthony Arino. He is the author of the brand new book, the hot brand new book, The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need Except Fanatical Prospecting. And <laughs> Anthony's also one of my very good friends. And Anthony, the reason that I wanted to spend some time with you today, because I know that there's something that in your heart, you spend a lot of time working with salespeople on. And I know that I find that I'm running into this issue again and again with sales teams. And that is the problem with stall deals. I find that not only are we having a hard time prospecting, like moving deals into the pipe, but when I sit in front of sales teams, and I did this this week, and I ask people to raise their hand if they've got stalled deals in their, you know, in their sales pipe, it, it's, it's almost unanimous. Salespeople are suffering from this. And when you talk to sales leaders, it's the bane of sales organizations, deals that are going nowhere. And one of the things that I find that drives that, now there's, there's some, some complexity here, but it's a pretty simple thing. And it's just that salespeople aren't consistently moving those deals to the next step. I mean, forget about, is it a qualified deal? Forget about, are they talking to the right person? They're simply not getting to the next step or asking for the next step to even validate if any of that is true. And this is something that I've heard you talk about over and over and over again. And you talk about it in the only sales guide you'll ever need. And you talk about it when you're spending time with salespeople. And I know you're working on a new book that's around this concept of next steps and micro commitments and why they're so important to sales. I wanted to have give my audience an opportunity to hear from you and your experience with what it takes to advance a deal through the pipeline, create velocity and momentum and move to closed. Yeah, this is, uh, I, was, I was with a group doing a workshop in um, Park City, Utah a week ago. And I asked a salesperson who was talking about a deal, and we were talking about consensus building. I said, what's the next step that you need to take with this opportunity in order to move it forward? And he looked at me and said directly, I don't know. And I said, okay. And my favorite question to follow up with is, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what would it be? And he said, I still don't know. (laughs) So he had no idea what comes next. And I'm watching his boss and the president of the company look at each other like, wait a second, if he doesn't know what comes next, who knows what comes next? And they start, I'm watching them just look at each other, having this conversation with just their eyes, you know, that something has gone terribly wrong. And and it's an epidemic. And there's a reason why. And the next book that, that I'll put out in August of 2017 is called The Lost Art of Closing. And it's because we framed up the idea of closing and commitment gaining only as the final commitment. And so what you call micro commitments, I think are macro commitments. I think they're big commitments. And there's 10 of them, at least 10 of them, sometimes more. And if a salesperson doesn't know exactly what that next commitment is, and they don't ask for it, and they don't know how to gain that commitment, then things go off of the rails and you end up with what's a stuck or a stalled deal. And I'll just share a couple of commitments with you. Um, you know these as well as I do. The first commitment, which you cover in Fanatical Prospecting, and this is why the book is so hot. I mean, it's certainly not because of your great looks, which I mean, contribute to the success of the book, but it's not the only reason, is that that first commitment of getting time and then the second commitment of exploring change, that's what Fanatical Prospecting does. And the reason it's so hot is because people now have been sold all these lies that inbound's going to cover you, marketing's going to cover you. Just go down on social media. You have plenty of opportunities, and it's not true. And then along comes fanatical prospecting. People who get it are like, I can get these first two commitments. I can get that commitment for time now, and I can get that commitment to explore. And once they get those commitments, they they know I need a discovery meeting. They know they need to present, but they don't really understand how much the sales cycle has changed. For me, the third commitment, a macro commitment, is are you even committed to change? And we think that 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 ask comes after we put the presentation of the proposal and investment in front of the client, but it's not an opportunity unless that prospective client believes that they're going through a change process with you. If they haven't committed to, hey, if, if this works right and if we can actually address these root cause issues, we will change. It's not an opportunity. It's a lead. And it, you can still work on a lead. I'm not saying take it out of your pipeline, don't do anything with it. But if they don't think that they're involved in the a change initiative, 
you missed a massive commitment that later on you get to the end, you hand over a proposal and they go, I don't know, we could do this or we could not do it. We could do it six months from now. Not a lot compelling me. And this is why you and I hear the question all the time. How do I compel my client to take action? You've got to ask them the big questions and get these commitments all along the path. That's what the role of a salesperson is. And and I frame this up in the second book, which you're going to get to read before anybody else does, is, uh, you know, we're, we're change agents. We're a catalyst for change. We're instigators and agitators. I mean, you particularly, I know. We come in and we say, things can be better here. You can do this different. And, and we go in and we start that change initiative. Now we have to understand all the commitments it takes when people really want to change, because if you don't get them, you end up with stuck or stalled deals or even things that are not even really deals. Let's let's roll back. To, I feel the um, I love the story of the two sales leaders sitting there looking at each other and you can see their eyes. And I know that, you know, like, you know what they're thinking. Yeah. And, you know, they're thinking, I'm just going to go around back and find a brick wall and bang my head against it as hard yeah. as I can. Because um, so let's let's start back there. My own sales team and I have a, a growing sales team. We use Salesforce.com. It's our CRM. And we, like every other company, we manage our opportunities and we have stages in our in our CRM that match the sales process that we teach or otherwise we'd be hypocrites. And when I do deal reviews, the only thing I look at is one field. And I created this field. It's a custom field for my company. And it's a field called Next Steps. Yeah. And it's it's free form. There's, there's not a drop down. And, and I've had a client who made a mistake of putting a drop down in there. What's the next step? And, and then the person had to put something in there. It's for me, it's totally a visual thing. The first thing yeah. I do is I pull the list and I look, if there's a hole, I got a problem. I don't yeah. care what stage I'm in. And that's what, one of the things that sort of drives my salespeople crazy. I don't care where they are. I don't care if they're at closing. I don't care if they're discovery. I don't care if they're at the very beginning. I don't care. What right. I'm looking for is a defined next step. And I mean, doesn't that go back to, the salesperson from the get go, like having a plan before they walk in, like, you know, yeah. I, you know, like I, I, I always Absolutely. ask myself, you know, why am I here? What's my objective for being here? What's the, what's the purpose of this call? And then what's my targeted next step? What's my ask? I mean, at the end of the call, I'm asking for something. And, you know, rule number one is never, ever, 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 ever walk out of a sales meeting. If you haven't gotten a commitment for something, yeah. And what, whatever that commitment might be, whether it's time or action or it's emotion, I mean, it's something, but you got to get that. I mean, why doesn't that happen? Like, why don't, why, like your salesperson says, I don't know what the next step is. I mean, how the hell are they going to explain that to the customer, what the next step is? How are they going to ask right. for it? How, how do you teach people to, to, to decide what that next step is, or at mm -hmm. least a fallback position if they can't get what they're asking for before they ever walk through the door? The, the they have to be taught in these commitments. What what I'm going to publish in 2017, I think, is going to change how people think of their sales process specifically because we think of it in outcomes. Like we have to do discovery, which means we need to understand the root cause of their needs and all these things. At the end of the day, you're right though. At the end of that meeting, there has to be something that the customer commits to. So the first thing we have to teach salespeople as sales leaders and sales managers is that when you say Jeb, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to send you the information that you ask for. I'll get that done when I get back to the office and I'll follow up with you. You made a commitment. The, the prospective client did not make a commitment. And so a lot of salespeople, when you look in the next steps, they have, well, they asked about this and they want to see this. No, those are your commitments and they're important. And I like that you capture them. That's a good thing to do is to know what you owe people. But they have to commit to doing something. And if you don't know what the next logical step is, it's difficult. And so the, the, the way that I look at this, you need time. You need to explore change. You need a commitment to actually change. You need a commitment to collaborate on what the solution is going to look like. Because now things are so complex, your client wants to work with you to make sure it gets dialed in so it's something that will actually work in their organization. You need a commitment to invest. And that commitment should come way earlier than most people who think it comes at the end of the process when they get to negotiate. You should get an agreement on what the investment's going to look like far, far earlier in, the, in the, the process. You need a commitment to review what you come up with so people get a chance to say it's not 100% right. Better to know that before you hand it over, right? Better to do that. You need a commitment to resolve their concerns. And they always have concerns. When we leave people alone, they resolve them on their own by saying, 
Maybe I just won't do anything for a while. And then you need the commitment to decide. That's the what we call closing. That commitment's number nine in a list of 10. And then you need a commitment to execute because we sell people things and we go back and they're not doing what they said they were going to do. And we have to go back and remind them we're doing this and you said you were going to do this and you're not. But if you don't get all those commitments, you're not really managing the sales process and the process of change. So you need to know what you need next. And for a rep, this can be anything. And I'm with you. I mean, I don't really care what stage it's in. You're in discovery and you're building consensus and you need to meet with people. Great commitment. You got a commitment to meet with three people on their team. That's great. You need to help people dial you in on what the presentation is going to look like. You need a collaboration meeting. Great. That's great. Works fine. You need them to review it. Maybe they have to review it two times, three times if it's complex. Who cares? All I want is I want to win at the end. And I know if I start skipping these outcomes that I need because they're not making the commitments, you and I are going to look at the pipeline and say, the next step is you're going to email them a price quote. How's that? How's what commitment did they make? And we're going to be unhappy with what we see because they don't really understand what this process of change looks like. Well, that's the problem, is it right? You know, the salesperson, you know, they're at the end of the meeting and they, in, instead of saying, okay, here's what we're going to do next. Um, the thing that we're going to do is I need to go grab some information. So I'm going to be meeting with your controller to get some data. Then I'm going to meet with your IT department to grab some data so we can validate and start building the business case. Right. And then I'm going to be back with you on Thursday on the 17th to walk you through what we learned and to make sure that we're on the right track. How does two o'clock work on your calendar? On your calendar? See, salespeople don't do that. What they say is, I'll get all this together and I'll give you a call. And the, 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 their, their stakeholder, whoever they're dealing with, is happy to say that to them. They're happy to go, okay, well, call me. Because the stakeholders don't want to put it on their calendar either. So they walk away with this vague call me maybe. And then the stakeholders in this meeting that never ends, they never able to get back in front of them and the deal stalls. And when or, I, maybe, or maybe the client does want to have that next meeting and they think you know what you're doing. You know, that, and, oh, that's a, that's and we a, hear these things like the buyer's 57% through their process. Not a lot of buyers I meet with. They're like, yeah, I'm not really sure. What, what do you think we should do next? I mean, they hope that you know how to lead the dance. And if you don't know how to lead the dance, they don't either. That's true. Now, hold on to that because I'm coming back to that. It was a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, and, but that's, you know, that's the problem. Like, you know, and I ask salespeople, why didn't you ask for the meeting? And they go, I just didn't want to be pushy. I'm like, dude, if you don't get they the next meeting, you're so going stuff. nowhere. It's, you're never going to get anywhere. But let me, you just said something profound and you do often. And that's why I steal all your stuff and <laughs> my own. Um, you said um, maybe they don't know the process. And that's one of the traits that I find in really great sales professionals. You know, sales professionals that are able to operate in this complex environment that you described, one of the things that I've noticed about them, and not just now, and this isn't something new, this is, I've noticed this since, you know, for 20 years, is that the very best salespeople have an uncanny knack at when they get into a qualified opportunity. I mean, that's, that's important to, to begin with. I mean, there's, there's some level of qualification there that they don't start at the beginning. They begin at the end. In other words, they map that journey. So they take a look at the sales process and the buying journey, and they align those two things. And then they go to their prospect, their stakeholders. It's usually in a complex deal. You've got multiple people you're dealing with. And they walk the stakeholders through what's going to happen. And by the way, this is one of the ways they create urgency, is that they're able to say, here are sp specific points in time where we have to make some decisions about whether or not you and I will continue to invest in this relationship. Look, look, if, if your client, your prospective client knew how to get the outcome that they need, they'd already be getting that outcome. And if your competitor knew how to walk them through the change to get the outcome that they needed, your competitor would have already done it. That they, They're in a state where they are right now because you know something that they don't know. You're expected to know how to walk them through that change process to get what they wanted, which means you have to be able to tell them, look, Jeb, normally in a situation like this, after we uncover the root cause and you and I agree that it needs to be solved and you've agreed that you need to change, the best thing for us normally together is to get some consensus, bring some people in on your team to collaborate around this so that they can support it or at least not oppose it when we bring this change. Who do you think we need to bring to the next meeting and when can we do that? I mean, you, you've you got to know this is what comes next because they're looking at you 
you're so you're there trying to sell them. They're not trying to sell you. You're supposed to know how it goes. And if you don't know how it goes, they're going to let you do whatever you do. If you say, hey, I'll call you in two weeks, they'll go, well, OK, maybe that's the right thing. Maybe that's how this works. They don't know. But the more control you have over that process, it doesn't mean you get to control the outcome, but it means you get to influence the outcome and massively increase your chances of winning. Right. Yeah. So that go- and that goes back to if you know what the process looks like and you've defined the steps and you've been able to ar- you know, clearly articulate that to the stakeholder group that you're working with and recognizing that the sales process is linear, but it's not necessarily you know, completely predictable. There are things that are going to change through discovery. You may uncover things. There may be other players that come up. If you do all those things, you ought to be able to, before you walk in the door for your meeting or before you get on the web conference or the phone call for your meeting, you should be able to define a couple of things. Why am I here? What's my objective for this particular meeting in the context of what I'm trying to create in the bigger picture in the sales process? And What's my targeted next step? What is the ideal next step that I'm going to ask for and gain commitment for? Uh, and I would say we'll, we'll plug that underneath the, t- the 10 commitments that you define. Those targeted next steps fall underneath each of those, right. those, those levels right. of commitment. What specifically am I asking for in this particular meeting that allows me to take this commitment, get this fully taken care of. I mean, if we, if we looked at maybe even a, you know, each of your commitments got one of those little circles, it's a hundred percent, you know, it's 20%, yeah. 30% forth, all the way up. I get those commitments that I know what I'm asking for. And, and this is important. If you can't get that commitment, sometimes you can't, sometimes you, you didn't do all the right things. Sometimes they aren't ready. Sometimes you just, you were just misaligned. You, you didn't both have the same idea of why you should be there, that you have a fallback so that you never, ever, ever walk out with a commitment. Yeah. It, because in my mind, that stalls deals more than anything else. Yeah, I, me too. You know, it, you've got to get something. Everybody's got to play. And and even, you know what, I don't know why people worry about this. You know, discovery is a stage. It's not a single meeting. I mean, if you sell something complex, so what if it takes you three meetings? So what? I mean, you're you're spending more time. You're creating a greater preference for you and your solution and your company. Spend the time. I mean, it, it's linear when we draw it out on paper, but it doesn't have to be linear in real life. I mean, you might do discovery, 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 presentation, revised presentation. It doesn't matter. Your job is to win. And and you get, uh, I've been doing a lot of research on this. You get 100% of both the revenue and the profit of uh, every deal that you lose. I like that. That's- I mean, so that that's your commission. You get 100% of everything that comes into your company on every deal that you lose. So your job is to win. I mean, that's that's why we're playing the game. So you take time and you give everybody what they need as you go through those commitments so that you get the yes at the end. I mean, that's the game that we play. Okay, so let's go all brain science on people, okay? And, uh, and talk about why commitments and micro commitments and next steps. Um, why these things are so important to your ability to influence the ultimate outcome that you described, which is winning. And let's start with something called the Ikea effect. And there's been a number of studies around the level of satisfaction that consumers have when they buy a piece of furniture at Ikea, as opposed to buying a piece of furniture at another retailer. And what the studies have found is that when people put the furniture together at Ikea, they feel more connected to it. They, they, they like it better and they feel an ownership to it that they don't when they don't put forth that effort. And if you think about something you said earlier, this concept of consensus or collaboration, uh, especially in the complex sale, and I'm not talking about yeah. you know a transactional deal where I talk to you and I close the deal in one spot, but where we're going through a journey over time, part of what you're describing through these commitments and getting people doing things is that in essence, they're putting the furniture of your of your sale together with you and therefore feel more ownership towards it, which at the end of the day makes them more likely to see value in doing business with, business with you. There's a couple of things there. One, when you understand the process and you can talk that through with a client, 
you elevate yourself, you help elevate yourself and to the status of a peer and not a salesperson because you understand I'm here as a trusted advisor and as counsel to you. And I'm consultative because I can help you go from your current state to a better future state. That's what you're doing. The second thing that, that you said there, that's exactly right. It's not my change initiatives. I, I, I don't own this. I'm the guy on the outside. I'm going to help you through this. But if you don't make the changes on your side, you don't get the outcome that you need. And this is why we have so much trouble winning deals and a lot of stuck opportunities. I mean, if I see it's single threaded, there's only one person and they say, that's my champion. That's my sponsor. You're dead. I mean, the, the bigger the sale, the more complex, the more stakeholders. And when they own it and they agree that this is the change that they need to make, it gets done. But when you try to force that change through because a couple of your sponsors want it and the rest of the group doesn't want it, it's hard to get through. And look, executive leadership, you know, we used to be told, call the C-level executive, start right at the top. C-level executive now is going to tell you this, hey, Jeb, I need you to work with the VP of sales and I need you to work with their, their, their managers because if they don't want to buy this and they're not all in, I can't spend the money on it. They got to say yes, because I'm not going to have, I'm not going to pay the money and then have them drag their feet and not do the work that we're committing to doing, which is why they want to bring so many people into the room because they want that buy-in. And when they own it, then the C-level executive can say, you own it. You said yes. You said you wanted it. I gave you the money. Now I expect to see the results. That's just what's changed in our world. And it, it's the reality. So now since it's the reality, that's how you play the game. Okay, so more brain science. Man, this is good stuff. You, you, you brought up a, a, a common conundrum in the complex deal, and that is that um, you've got multiple stakeholders, and, and the reason that a deal is complex is because it's risky, and there's risk to both the company and risk to the stakeholders. So when you've got an array of stakeholders, one of the things that you have to do as a salesperson is you've got to get those folks in line. They have to all be moving in a similar direction. Now, it's not always possible, but you need much a, a bunch of them. Now, your buddy, uh, Cialdini, who wrote um, the book uh, Influence, um, he talks about um, social proof. And it's we think about social proof in that if a bunch of people are doing something as a human being, you'll want to do that too. What you'll do is you'll substitute your own judgment for the judgment of other people. But the same thing is applied at the microcosm of the sales process. And that if you are getting regular commitments from your stakeholders and you become the communication hub that reminds and, and uh, amplifies that to all the stakeholders that they are in agreement, you have to help them because they're not always in the same place. And they're all trying to avoid risk for themselves. You're able to actually leverage this concept of social proof in that microcosm through all these commitments to get all of those folks aligned so that they feel less risk individually for making a decision right. and are more, more probable or more likely to stand up and tell that VP or that executive, hey, this is what we've decided. But you almost have to orchestrate that, don't you? Yeah, you're you're talking about, I guess, what would be the opposite of uh, pluralistic ignorance in Cialdini's book. And pluralistic ignorance is when everybody doesn't take any action because they assume another person is taking action. And and that's one of the ways that social proof works, too. But that you're right. If, if we're making the decision as a team, the responsibility is now spread across everybody on the team. So individually, I'm only one eighth of the decision here instead of the decider which means if something goes wrong, we all committed to it. And that distribution of responsibility makes it easier for people to say yes. If everybody else is saying yes, it's safer for them to come in and say yes. There's no doubt about it. But really, you do want the people to challenge this too. I mean, you want the people who say, it's not going to work in my area. Here's why. So you can try to mitigate it. Or you can at least say, we knew this was going to be the case when we got here. And here's what we said we were going to do about it. And now you need to make this change. But we, we do... You know, in, a, in the second book, for me, there's a, a, a realization that I think that I, it's important to share with salespeople. We're, we're in the change business, and the change business is a hard business. We're asking people to do something different on their end, because if what they were doing was already working, they wouldn't need us, but they need us. So when we come in, we have to help them change, and it means they have to do different things. And when you can get a group of them to go together, things tend to move really fast, and they tend to get better results a lot faster, too. The you said something that I it, when we start talking about next steps and commitment that I see especially rookie salespeople who 
get moved into a complex environment that they discount. And that is that you definitely want to get you want to get the reason why people wouldn't do business with you out on the table. It's best to do that one to one, not in a group setting. In a group yes. setting, you you can um, you can create a feeling of risk for people. But I see a lot of young salespeople who don't define the stakeholder array, and they don't they don't look at all the people that have any influence whatsoever, and then try to understand them. And I, I tend to break. I'm a simplistic guy. I'm, I, I I tend to break stake influencers basically into three people. They're advocates for you. They're agnostics. They, you know, they, they, they don't have a, an opinion either way. And they're naysayers. And naysayers aren't people who are always against you. It's just that they don't feel like this is going to work for them. And right. what, what young people do is they avoid having the, that, the, the, that, that conflict. And I think that's, that's something that, that's, that you can learn over time. You get some experience with that. You get some reps. You get that. But more than anything, where they really make the mistake is they don't go meet with all of the stakeholders. I mean, they don't use those as next steps. They meet with a person that they have defined as the decision maker, which is, you know, I, I have no idea what decision makers are anymore these days. But but they never reach out and say, I need to meet all these people. And Anthony, what I don't know is, is it a, is it a shortcut? Is it because they they don't want to put the work in or don't see value in the work or is it ignorance or is it a, is it? It's, a bun- it's, it's, it's many different uh, reasons. So I'll share some with you. One being conflict averse for sure uh, is a problem. If I know somebody's probably going to give me resistance, being conflict averse is not going to help you. And, and there's, there's conflict and friction in business. It comes with the territory, trusted advisor, consultative counsel, salespeople, you that that's where all the action is that's where you become a trusted advisor is knowing how to deal with that another reason you've got the stakeholder who's super receptive your power sponsor or champion or however you want to define them and they'll say jeb listen i don't want to bring in it into this because here's what's going to happen you got sales gravy university they're going to say we don't want to give them access we're going to be using up all this bandwidth we're not putting another project on our deck we'll never get it done if we go to to it they'll kill it. And then what happens at the end of that is IT finds out about it and says, we can't do it too much of a security risk. We're killing it anyway. You know, and the the greater danger is not going to IT, but even your stakeholder will have a fear of bringing IT in because they're going to go, you know, in our company, we have, we don't have an IT department. We have an SH IT department, which is like an IT department, but it's different. It's a super (laughs) helpful IT department. (laughs) uh, and th- there's there's these reasons. And then sometimes they're just worried about when they resist. I don't know how to mitigate the harm it's going to cause people in this area. I don't know how to talk about it. It's another reason. And some people just don't know that they have to do it. There are some salespeople who just don't know that there's a group that's going to make a decision and they don't know who's in that group. And without knowing who's in that group and who who's going to be maybe representing a group of stakeholders, you don't talk to them because you don't know they exist. And, you know, that's a question that you ask early on. And you say, who else is going to be impacted by this? And who do we need to bring into this conversation to make sure that they can support what we're doing and that we get all of their ideas so we can build something great here? I mean, you you, you, you can do it. You just have to know what needs to be done. Thank you so much for, for this today. This is great information. And I think what I want to leave you with is this. Um, on your next sales call, on your next sales call, do not leave before you get your next step and do not walk through the door unless you know what your ask is going to be. And Anthony, before we go, I want to talk about your brand new book, The Only Sales God You'll Ever Need. It's an awesome book. It's fantastic. We love this book. Can, can you tell us what's in this book, what people can expect? Yeah, the book is two halves. The first half is mindset. The second half is skill set. And we put that together that way for one reason, who you are matters more than what you do. So you need to be the kind of person that people want to work with and that they want to buy from first and foremost. So you're going to learn things like discipline and optimism and caring and competitiveness and resourcefulness and initiative and a whole bunch of things that are going to make you super attractive as a partner when you go out and sell. And then we're going to get into the second half of the book, which are the skill sets. And I'll just talk about three of them. Business acumen, most important attribute you need to develop right now. You've got to have some chops and understand how to help people get better results. Change management, which we've been talking about on this this, uh, episode of whatever it is we're shooting here, because it's probably a whole bunch of things, uh, and how to get consensus and how to help people change, because that's what we do. 
And then leadership, which is so important because you have to lead your team and your client's team to better results. That's what's in the book. It really is the only sales guide you'll ever need. But when I get questions about prospecting books right behind you over your left shoulder, fanatical prospecting, that is the Harry Potter of sales books right now. It's selling like crazy. How many reviews does that have? 300? Uh, we're over 300 now. Yeah. Over 300. Amazing. Because it's exactly the right book for people right now. And I will tell you, um, if you haven't picked that book up and you're opportunity starved, and most people are, that'll, that'll cure whatever ails you. Fantastic. Thank you. Anthony Arino, the smartest man in sales, the only sales guide you'll ever need except for fanatical prospecting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm Jeff Blood. I'm CEO of salesgravy.com and I'm the author of Fanatical Prospecting. And we'll see you again on another Sales Masters episode. Thanks, Anthony.